This is an apology in the sense of a Greek apologia, the systematic defense of an opinion or position. It's a defense of Roger Ebert, the Pulitzer Prize winning film critic for the New York, uh, the Chicago Sun Times, who for a little over five years ago annoyed our industry by declaring that, quote, video games can never be art. For those few of you unacquainted with this controversy, I'll spend just a few minutes recounting what happened. It all started with a bad movie. On October 21st, 2005, Universal released its adaptation of the classic first-person shooter game, Doom. I didn't see Doom, but Roger Ebert did. He awarded the movie one star. In his review, he wrote, quote, Towards the end of the movie, there is a lengthy point of view shot looking forward over the barrel of a large weapon. Monsters jump out from behind things and are blasted to death in a sequence that abandons all attempts at character and dialogue and uncannily resembles a video game. A few days later, a reader from Missouri responded on Ebert's blog. He wrote that Doom, the movie, is Doom the Game brought to the screen without messing around too much with the original. Doom works as a tribute because it fails so utterly as a movie. <laughs> Ebert's reply was terse. There are sites on the web devoted to video games, and they review movies on their terms. I review them on mine. Unfortunately, Ebert couldn't resist throwing in just one more zinger. Quote, as long as there is a great movie unseen or a great book unread, I will continue to be unable to find time to play video games. The response from gamers was prompt. <laughs> Hundreds of indignant blog comments poured in from everywhere. At first, Ebert seemed willing to discuss his opinion. When a reader from Denver asked, are you implying that books are better mediums or just better uses of your time, Ebert responded, I believe books and films are better mediums and better uses of my time. But how can I say that when I admit I am unfamiliar with video games? Because I have recently seen classic films by Fassbender, Ozu, Herzog, Scorsese, and Kurosawa, and have recently read novels by Dickens, Cormac McCarthy, Bellow, Nabokov, and Hugo, and if there were video games in the same league, someone somewhere who was familiar with the best work in all three mediums would have made a convincing argument in their defense. The comments increased in volume and temperature. On November 27th, a reader wrote, I was saddened to read that you consider video games an inherently inferior medium. Was not film itself once a new field of art? Did it not also take decades for its respectability to be recognized? Ebert responded, Yours is the most civil of countless messages I have received. After writing that I did indeed consider video games inherently inferior to film and literature. There is a structural reason for this. Video games by their nature require player choices which is the opposite of the strategy of serious film and literature, which requires authorial control. He continued, I am prepared to believe that video games can be elegant, subtle, sophisticated, challenging, and visually wonderful. But I believe the nature of the medium prevents it from moving beyond craftsmanship to the stature of art. To my knowledge, no one in or out of the field has ever been able to cite a game worthy of comparison with the great dramatists, poets, filmmakers, novelists, or composers, that a game can aspire to artistic importance as a visual experience, I accept. But for most gamers, video games represent a loss of those precious hours we have available to make ourselves more cultivated, civilized, and empathetic. After this, aside from an occasional snark, Ebert appeared to have written everything he cared to say on the subject. Now, to many of you, this issue probably seems like a thoroughly dead horse. I thought it was dead, too. 
Not because anything was actually decided, mind you, but because after nearly five years of table pounding, everyone seemed tired of arguing about it. Oh, okay. Hold on a minute. What's the matter? Oh, it's all good. Is this one off now? Hold on, they're switching me to higher technology. <laughs> Can you hear me? Yeah. Sound better? Yeah. Good. But a few weeks after GDC ended last March, the flame war erupted again. The Fuse was a TEDx lecture by Kelly Santiago, co-founder and president of That Game Company. Her lecture was titled, Stop the Debate. Video games are art, so what's next? She cited three games, Waco Resurrection, Braid, and her own company's Flower, as examples of games that she believes already qualify as art. A video of her lecture appeared on YouTube, some troublemaker recommended it to Roger Ebert. <laughs> on April 16th, Ebert posted a critique of Santiago's lecture under the blunt headline, Video Games Can Never Be Art. He dismissed Waco Resurrection, Braid, and Flower as, quote, pathetic, and sternly predicted that no video gamer now alive will survive long enough to experience the medium as an art form. Thousands of comments followed, nearly all of them in fierce protest. Finally, on the 1st of July, just before the call for submissions to this conference was announced, Ebert posted what again seemed to be his final word on the subject. Under the title, OK, kids, play on my lawn, Ebert wrote, I declared as an axiom that video games can never be art. I still believe this, but I should never have said so. He went on to admit that his arguments might be more convincing if he actually bothered to play some games. He also appeared to backpit, backpedal a little bit. He wrote, what I was saying is that video games could not in principle be art. That was a foolish position to take, particularly as it seemed to apply to the entire unseen future of games. It is quite possible that a game could someday be art. His weary conclusion? I have books and movies to see. I was a fool for mentioning video games in the first place. Having heard all this, you may be wondering, what is there left to defend? Ebert caved. He admitted games could be art eventually, didn't he? Given enough time, anything not impossible is inevitable, right? Well, maybe. But that's not the part of our Ebert's argument I'm here to defend. I'm here because of this sentence. No one in or out of the field has ever been able to cite a game worthy of comparison with the great dramatists, poets, filmmakers, novelists, and composers. Kelly Santiago conceded this point in the first 60 seconds of her TEDx lecture. And as Ebert himself never tired of pointing out, not one of the thousands of comments he received seriously attempted any such comparison. Now, Although I'm not as experienced as Roger Ebert, experienced being a polite euphemism for elderly, <laughs> I'm no spring chicken either. My formal education is in English. I've read many of the great books in our language and in other languages in translation. I've also watched a number of great movies, seen a number of great paintings and sculptures, and heard a lot of fine music, although never as much as I would like. I've also been in the video game industry for nearly 30 years. Unlike Mr. Ebert, I have played many of the games widely regarded as great and seminal. I have the privilege, privilege of knowing many of the authors personally. But as much as I admire games like Mule, Balance of Power, Sim City, and Civilization, it would never even occur to me to compare them to the treasures of world literature, painting, or music. And I'm pretty sure the authors of those particular games wouldn't presume to either. Why are some people in this industry so anxious 
about wrapping themselves in the mantle of great art. It occurred to me that an art museum might be a really good place to think about this. As it happens, there's a really good art museum just a few blocks east of Worcester Polytech, where I teach game design. So late one morning, I find myself in the galleries of Wham, the Worcester Art Museum, wandering among the Monets and Manets, Matisses and Magritte's. One canvas in particular caught my eye. It was painted in 1730 by James Northcutt, a member of the British Royal Academy of Arts. Northcutt was amazingly prolific. Over 2,000 works are attributed to him. He painted historic and current news events, scenes from the Bible, classic literature, together with hundreds of portraits. It was his animal paintings that attracted the most attention, though. Northcutt made a fortune with his dramatic depictions of jungle cats, elephants, dogs, and birds. A rival artist, Henry Fuseli, is said to have remarked, Northcutt, you were an angel and an ass, but an ass and an angel. This Northcutt in the collection of the Worcester Art Museum is not, for the most part, about animals. The chess players shows a pair of gentlemen pondering over an endgame. There's a boy standing behind one of the players and a little dog sitting in the corner. If you study this painting for a while, you'll notice a couple of interesting details. For one thing, the chess players are clearly not the center of attention. They're dressed in dark, sober colors that recede into the space of the painting. By contrast, the boy appears in blazing gold. It looks as if he's under a spotlight. Yet he shows no interest in the chess game. His attention is directed away from the world of the painting. In fact, he appears to be staring directly at you, the viewer. In his left hand is a sheet of paper covered with undecipherable characters. His right finger appears to be pointing at something. But what? The sheet of paper? The head of the man beside him? What's that stupid little dog doing there? <laughs> well, we'll probably never know. Everyone connected with the creation of this painting has been dead for generations. I spent a long time sitting in front of the chess players on the bench. The elements of this painting came to symbolize for me the predicament I faced by choosing to defend Roger Ebert at the biggest game conference in the world. The two chess players are like the game industry, self-absorbed, satisfied, <laughs> confident that they will soon earn their place among the fine arts if they haven't already. And the golden boy is art itself, silently watching us, pointing at a secret he longs to share. In preparing this lecture, I plowed through a 700-page anthology of Western art philosophy, including the writings of Plato, Aristotle, Plotinus, Augustine, Fincino, Kant, Schelling, Hegel, Schopenhauer, Shaftesbury, Croce, Nietzsche, Dewey, and Heidegger. I also read a deadly boring book on 20th century aesthetic theory, including the writings of Weitz, Dickey, and Danto. Nowhere in 25 centuries of philosophy did I find a single author who regarded games or sports as a form of art. When they're mentioned at all, they're dismissed as a pastime, harmless at best, an evil destroyer of youth at worst. Now, it's true that a number of art museums include antique toys and games in their exhibits. Some of them, including occasionally MoMA, the Whitney, and soon the Smithsonian, even display antique video games. It's also true that games, usually dice or cards, have often been the subject or theme of great art. I found a website with over 220 pictures of people playing chess, and it doesn't even include this one by Northcutt. It's also true that certain 20th century art movements, including Dada, Fluxus, and New Games, incorporated rules and play into their works. These are remembered now chiefly by academics, except for Fluxus, which is famous because one of its members married a beetle. And you'll occasionally come across a philosopher or artist who admires the playful aspect of games or the elegance of a chess problem. Some people admire the elegance of math equations, too, but nobody confuses mathematics with art. There are different categories of human activity. And that's how philosophy has traditionally regarded art and games, categorically different. Suggesting that a game could be great art is radical. On the other hand, the idea of great art 
is itself somewhat radical. It only dates back about 500 years. Before that, art was essentially practical. You valued the thing an artwork represented, not the artwork itself. Since that time, the definition of art has undergone a continuous evolution as new ideas and technologies appeared. This process has never been rapid or easy. It took many decades for photography and cinema to earn their places among the Hegelian fine arts of painting, sculpture, poetry and drama, music, dance, and architecture. Now, it's natural and tempting for us to expect that games will follow the same pattern. But there's a big difference. Photography and cinema were new technologies. Games are not new. They've been part of our culture for thousands of years. They're much older than the bell arts of the Renaissance, older than the representational art of the Greeks, older than the cave paintings of prehistory. By what right do games suddenly demand the status of great art? If chess and Go, arguably the two greatest games in history, have never been regarded as works of art, why should Missile Command? Are digital games somehow privileged, somehow more artistic than analog games? Or does the fact that video games are now almost as big as dog food somehow entitle them to a free museum pass? <laughs> now, before we can proceed any further, we need to pause and address the basic semantic problem. You knew this was coming. All of us, even Roger Ebert, can clearly say what a video game is. Can any of you tell me what great art is? Trying to define great art is like trying to define experience. We all have an internal sense of what it signifies, but articulating it is really difficult. And the intellectual fad of relativism makes it practically impossible. Here's a classic demonstration. Suppose I'm walking along a beach and come across a stick of driftwood. I stop in my tracks. I don't touch the driftwood. I don't say anything. I don't point out the driftwood to anyone. Right there, in that moment, is that driftwood a work of art? I pick up the driftwood and without changing it, bring it home and put it on my mantelpiece. Is the driftwood art yet? I sign and date the driftwood and send it to an art gallery. They put it on a pedestal under a spotlight. Are we having art yet? An art collector buys the driftwood at auction for over a million bucks. What did that collector buy? Let's play the art game again. This time I walk into a plumbing supply shop and pick out a standard white porcelain urinal. I sign and date the urinal and ship it to an art gallery. Is that urinal art? I am being completely serious when I inform you that Marcel Duchamp's fountain is considered by many critics to be the single most influential artwork of the 20th century. It would probably also be the most valuable artwork of the 20th century if it had not been accidentally thrown away with the gallery trash. Luckily, all was not lost. No less than 11 authentic replicas, individually certified by the artist, are available for your contemplation at various art galleries. One of these was auctioned in 1999 for $1.7 million. A number of so-called performance artists have been arrested for trying to pee in these replicas. Most of them are now protected in transparent plastic cases. The replicas, not the performance artists. <laughs> Duchamp and his so-called ready-mades broke the Renaissance idea of art wide open. He and generations of so-called conceptual artists changed the focus of modern art appreciation. Instead of aesthetic value, the emphasis shifted to novelty value. By the 1960s, Marshall McLuhan was being only a little cynical when he wrote, Art is anything you can get away with. It seems totally fair to ask, if a piss pot can be great art, why not a video game? Another argument for games as art goes something like this. Video games incorporate and even generate still and moving pictures, which everyone agrees can be great art. 
They incorporate and generate writing, music, sculptured objects, and architecture, which can also be great art. Suppose I design a platformer with backgrounds by Michelangelo, black and white characters from Igmar Bergman movies, pop-up quotations from Shakespeare, and music from the well-tempered clavier. I call it, all your art is belong to us. The presentation of that game is filled with great art. Games can obviously be a context for presenting great art. Roger Ebert admits this. But is this enough? Does artistic presentation make a game art? Of course it doesn't. None of you would presume to call that game art unless you had a chance to play it first. Or at least watch somebody else playing it. The identity of a game emerges from its mechanics and affordances, not the presentation that supports them. But can an arrangement of mechanics and affordances, rules and goals, itself constitute a work of art? Before you scream yes, explain to me why chess is not regarded as a work of art. Before you scream it is, ask yourself, are we so willing to dismiss the wisdom of ages to flatter ourselves? Does it even make sense to speak of mechanics and affordances apart from presentation? Is it at all one piece? Or is it all just mathematics with a sprinkle of positive psychology? The gamificationists certainly seem to think so. It's hard for anybody, even so-called experts, to agree on what constitutes great art. Back in 1900, the trustees of the Boston Symphony Orchestra commissioned a beautiful new auditorium. Around the edges of the gold proscenium, they mounted a series of nine flat plaques, three on the left, three on the right, and three across the top. The plan was to inscribe these plaques with the names of the world's nine greatest composers. We can imagine the names that were being thrown around, you know, Bach, Mozart, Handel, Haydn, Brahms. But when it came time to actually sit down and determine which composers would be honored, the trustees couldn't make up their minds. And so, for the past 111 years, visitors to Boston Symphony Hall sit before a gold proscenium with eight empty plaques. Only one at the very top of the stage contains a name, the only one the trustees could all agree on, Beethoven. Everyone has their own taste, right? Beauty is in the eye of the beholder. This commonplace was noted by the German philosopher Immanuel Kant, who strongly criticized it. His argument went like this. If you declare that something gives you pleasure, nobody can argue with you. Subjective pleasure is absolutely in the eye of the beholder, assuming that the eye is the organ involved. But if you announce that something is beautiful, you have made a public value judgment. You've identified that thing as a source of pleasure that can be enjoyed by anyone. In making such a declaration, you exercise the faculty known as taste. It makes no sense to say that everyone has their own taste. This is tantamount to claiming there's no common pleasure at all, only personal pleasure. But our everyday experience tells us that's not true. People agree that objects are pleasant or unpleasant all the time. Psychologists even have a fancy technical term for this kind of agreement, where an emotion is shared by more than one person. They call it intersubjectivity. Certain people make it their business to exercise taste. These people are called, pinkies up, connoisseurs. If a connoisseur's disinterested exercise of taste earns the agreement of many over time, he or she is called an expert. Such an expert is Roger Ebert. Here is a point I hope we can all agree on. Roger Ebert knows movies. He's been writing about them since the 1960s. He's reviewed hundreds and hundreds of films in print, on the web, and on television, and published over a dozen books. It's no exaggeration to call him one of the world's best-known and most widely read film critics. His opinion about the relationship between video games and art may be plausibly dismissed as uninformed. He admits this. He admits that he doesn't play video games and doesn't even want to play them. Nevertheless, most of us would hesitate to dismiss his opinion on the relationship between movies and art. So, what does the tasteful expert connoisseur Roger Ebert have to say about the relationship between cinema and art? He says this, hardly any movies are art. Okay, 
maybe Roger was having a bad day. Let's move right along to another one of the world's great film critics. Here's what the late Pauline Kael wrote about the relationship between movies and art. Listen carefully. Quote, there is so much talk now about the art of the film that we may be in danger of forgetting that most of the movies we enjoy are not works of art. Movies are so rarely great art that if we cannot appreciate great trash, we have very little reason to be interested in them. So here we have two of the world's great film critics sadly assuring us that most movies are not great art. Defining great art apparently won't be enough. We also have to figure out how to distinguish great art from trash. But first, let's set aside a couple of issues regarding the word art. In English, the word art has several meanings. In one sense, art is used as a synonym for craft. Any artifact made by an artisan is a kind of art. In another sense, any exercise of skill, any practice can be spoken of as an art. The art of cooking, the art of war, the art of motorcycle maintenance. In these, sentence, in these senses, the products and practices of game making are obviously qualifying as art. But Ebert and Kale weren't using art in either of those sentences. When Ebert refers to art, he means and actually spells art with a capital A. Great art, fine art, or the term I prefer, sublime art. Art that deeply rewards a lifetime of contemplation. Art that's good for you. The kind of art that, in Ebert's words, makes us more cultivated, civilized, and empathetic. Well, that kind of talk has earned Mr. Ebert that most deadly of anti-intellectual epithets, elitist. The horror novelist Clive Barker led the mob, dismissing Ebert as, quote, an arrogant old man, pompous, high-handed, while adding, if the experience moves you some way or another, even if it only moves your bowels, I think it's worthy of some serious study. <laughs> hey, it made you laugh. He's right, it is art. <laughs> Many people seem to share Barker's belief that the function of art is to elicit emotion, to make you feel things, to move people. Let's quickly dispose of this. Last April, the U.S. Supreme Court ruled that videos of small animals being deliberately stomped to death was a constitutionally protected form of free speech. Would you like to see one of these videos? If I press that play button... I promise you will experience strong emotion. Stomp videos may make me feel things, but I reject them as art. And I look forward to the high court's opinion on whether or not video games are also constitutionally protected speech. The function of art is not merely to elicit emotion. A slip on a banana peel can do that. The function, not the purpose, the function of all art, high or low, from angry birds to Hellraiser to the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel, is attraction. Art has no practical purpose. Nobody needs art. Why would anybody bother to make art that nobody would be attracted to? But how do we distinguish sublime attractions from the common attractions Pauline Kael dismisses as trash? Why do Ebert and Kael believe that very few movies are sublime art? And how can Ebert predict with such confidence that no video game is ever likely to be sublime art without even playing any? And if he's wrong, if a game really can be sublime art, why hasn't anybody made one? Such are the questions I pondered as I sat before Northcote's chess players. It seemed to me, as I studied the painting, that there are three reasons why video games have failed to deliver sublime art. These reasons are neatly symbolized by the three major elements of the painting. The most obvious has been staring you in the face since 2 o'clock. It's not the chess players. It's not the golden boy or his secret if he has one. It's the dog. We don't know who, if anyone, commissioned this painting from Northcote, but if it was a commission, we can say one thing with a high degree of certainty. Whoever it was had plenty of money. In the early 18th century, when the chess players was painted, there were generally two classes of people in Europe. 
the well-to-do, and the near starving. Get used to it. We'll be there again soon. Most 18th century people didn't worry about buying paintings. It was all they could do to keep their families alive. But things got a little better in the 19th century. Political changes, urbanization, improvements in mass production and education gave rise to what we now call the middle class. These people had enough money to keep their families reasonably comfortable with a little money left over for the occasional small luxury. As their social standing improved, the petit bourgeois wanted some of the things the rich people enjoyed, like books, nice clothes, and decorated homes. So around the 1860s or 70s, a market developed catering to their limited budgets and tastes. They still couldn't afford commissioned art, but there were plenty of second-rate painters happy to provide a quick knockoff to hang over the fireplace. These paintings resembled great art, picturesque landscapes, idyllic domestic scenes, portraits of celebrities. The art dealers of Munich were apparently the first to nickname this new mass market art. Some scholars think it was a mispronunciation of the English word sketch. Others claim it was a contraction of a German verb which means to make cheaply. Whatever its origin, by the 1920s, this nickname had become the international expression for those pink flamingos, velvet elvises, and adorable puppy dogs we all know and love as kitsch. Quite a few books have been written about the aesthetics of kitsch. One of the best is by Thomas Kulka of Tel Aviv University. Kulka argues that kitsch is not bad art. He sees it as a unique aesthetic category, a special kind of art characterized by three properties. One, Kitsch depicts objects or themes that are highly charged with stock emotions. Kitsch is about simple feelings, universal ideas, good and evil, happy and sad. Your response to these ideas is automatic. You know how you're supposed to feel about sad clowns, James Dean, and horses running along a windswept beach. In fact, part of the appeal of kitsch seems to lie precisely in recognizing that as you look at it, you're feeling the way you're supposed to. Kitsch validates you. Two, the objects or theme depicted by kitsch are instantly and effortlessly identifiable. Kitsch art is utterly conventional. There's never any doubt about what it is you're looking at. It's a leprechaun and only a leprechaun. It's Santa Claus, and only Santa Claus. Kitsch art is surface art. It's just what you expect. Three, and most important, kitsch does not substantially enrich our associations relating to the depicted objects or themes. The last thing kitsch wants to be is challenging. Pure kitsch is never ironic, ambiguous, troubling, or innovative. Kitsch art is popular art, and nearly all popular art is kitsch. Our mass market culture is so thoroughly imbued with kitsch, it's the only kind of art many people ever experience. Broadway musicals, theme parks, casinos, rock stars, cable news, all kitsch. All advertising is kitsch. All media driven by advertising devolves into kitsch. Sequels, spin-offs, knockoffs, reboots, and adaptations from other media are automatically kitsch. Politics thrives on kitsch. And Roger Ebert has spent over 40 years in dark theaters sitting through thousands and thousands and thousands of hours of shameless Hollywood kitsch. Could anyone be more familiar with what happens when you apply commercial pressure to popular art? Is there anyone on the planet more qualified to predict that video games will suffer the same fate? Listen to this review of Call of Duty Black Ops, published in the New York Times a few days after it was released last December. Quote, I never play video games twice, but Call of Duty Black Ops has made a happy liar out of me. I wanted to try to assassinate Fidel Castro again. 
and break out of a Soviet prison camp again and pilot a gunboat through the Mekong Delta again, shooting up sandpans while listening to Sympathy for the Devil. The Cold War has never been so much fun. Black Ops does not really innovate, but it doesn't have to. Rather, it reflects a keen intelligence and a rigorous, disciplined understanding of each individual element of modern game design. It then executes on delivers in a way that demonstrates how well-oiled a game-making machine Robert A. Kotick, Activision's chief executive, has created. Call of Duty Black Ops made more money faster than any entertainment product in history. How? By depicting instantly identifiable themes, highly charged with stock emotions. By not trying to enrich players' associations with those themes. By not innovating. Video games are an industry. You are attending a giant industry conference. Industries make products. Video game products contain plenty of art, but it's product art, which is to say, kitsch art. Kitsch art is not bad art. It's commercial art, art designed to be sold easily and in quantity. And the bigger the audience, the kitschier it's going to get. <laughs> kitsch is a risk reduction strategy. A risk reduction strategy time-tested and good for business. Kitsch is robust. Details of execution don't matter very much. You can change stuff around without affecting its utility. But sublime art is fragile. It lives or dies in the details. There's nothing superfluous or out of place. As author C.S. Lewis wrote, that word and no other, in that place and no other. Kitsch is like Duchamp's urinal. You flush it when you're done using it. Kitsch is fundamentally standard, and when standards change, it first becomes irrelevant, and then corny, and finally, the subject of nostalgia. Sublime art is either always relevant or not at all. It is never the subject of nostalgia, but often the subject of discovery. Kitsch can be brilliantly executed, wonderfully entertaining, and culturally significant. It is often mistaken for great art and awarded with honors, especially by those industries that specialize in it. <laughs> One way to deal with the overwhelming prevalence of kitsch is to celebrate it. While you're here in the city, take a trolley up to the Fairmont Hotel on Knob Hill. Down in the sub-sub basement, you'll find one of the best surviving examples of 40s tiki kitsch, the Tonga Room. Yes. <laughs> the food in the Tonga Room is practically inedible. <laughs> <laughs> but after the second fall, after the second faux Polynesian umbrella cocktail served in a real pineapple, you won't care. <laughs> In the middle of the room, there's an artificial pond with a little island that floats around. A band on the island plays tinkly pop music. But here's the best part. Every hour, there's a simulated tropical thunderstorm. It rains around the edge of the pond. The Tonga room is delightful. I smile when I walk in there, and I'm smiling even more when I leave. <laughs> the technical term for the celebration of kitsch is camp. Welcome to San Francisco, the camp capital of the world. <laughs> Ultimately, though, camp is an evasive strategy. Camp embraces kitsch, but refuses to the commit to the risk of creating art. We shouldn't expect publicly traded game studios to produce anything but kitsch. But what about the indies? Indies are small and nimble. Their stockholders are the employees. They can afford to risk creating art, right? Well, that's the fantasy. In reality, indies are under the same commercial pressures as the big studios. They have a little more wiggle room for innovation and risk, but only a little. And if they fail, they have no cushion. If anything, there's even more pressure never to fail. 
As a result, most indies secretly, or not so secretly, aspire to produce authentic-looking kitsch. Kitsch with an edge, if they're good, but kitsch, nevertheless. The well-oiled game-making machines manufacture kitsch. The indies struggle to imitate them. Who's left to create sublime art? The people who create art anyway. The artists. If anyone is going to pwn Roger Ebert, they'll probably be the ones to do it. There is genuine hope there, but there is also a subtle danger. If you consciously set out trying to make an art game, it is possible that you will instead create an arty game. A game with the trappings of sublime art. Solemn themes. Classical music. Literary quotations. Participation from artistic celebrities from other media. These things don't necessarily make a game artistic. I should know. I've tried them all. But this warning should not be taken as an excuse never to try. Many embarrassing failures would be worth the effort if they culminated in a single, authentic work of art. The dog is in the painting because whoever bought the painting asked for a dog. But the kitsch that dogs our industry isn't the only reason we fail to produce sublime art. Consider again the two chess players, masters of the game. All art forms depend on mastery. Painters, sculptures, writers, musicians, filmmakers, and architects all require tools, instructions, and years and years of hard, actual practice. We game developers are no different, but we are at a distinct disadvantage. The tools and technology we work with are, and always have been, slippery. In 1894, Thomas Edison and William Dixon introduced the kinetoscope. It used plastic 35-millimeter film perforated on both sides. Each image frame occupied four perforations. The film ran vertically through the camera and projector at a speed of about 16 frames per second. Within a few years, Edison's 35-millimeter film standard became the worldwide de facto type of film. Cameras and projectors improved. A few minor changes were made for the introduction of sound, but the basic format... The fundamental engineering parameters controlling the design, production, distribution, and exhibition of movies remained virtually unchanged for over 115 years. Compare this to the first four decades of video gaming. Dozens of computer architectures, seven generations of consoles, zero uniformity in processing power, memory, resolution, color space, or audio, a bewildering array of platforms from cell phones to pimped up alienwares. Now, let's talk about the business of video games. During the five years I worked at Lucasfilm, the management of the games division changed six times. Acquisitions, layoffs, cancellations, closing studio doors, lawsuits, you've all been there. How could a potential artist hope to accumulate any deep practice in this maelstrom? How can we create in such an atmosphere? <laughs> the third reason why video games have failed as a sublime art is the most subtle, the most speculative, and maybe the most important. Is there, as Roger Ebert suggested, a structural Intrinsic reason why video games cannot be sublime art. Let's turn again to the golden boy. As you meet his haughty gaze, let me read you some of the things Roger Ebert has written about video games and art. Quote, I believe art is created by an artist. If you change it, you become the artist. Quote, Art seeks to lead you to an inevitable conclusion, not a smorgasbord of choices. Quote, video games represent a loss of those precious hours we have available to make ourselves more cultivated, civilized, and empathetic. At one point, Clive Barker pleaded with him, I'm just saying that gaming is a great way to do what we as human beings need to do all the time to take ourselves away from the oppressive facts of our lives and go somewhere where we have our own control. Ebert's retort to this was icy. I do not have a need all the time to take myself away from the oppressive facts of my life, however oppressive they may be, in order to go somewhere where I have control. 
I need to stay here and take control. These quotes are boulder-sized clues as to Ebert's sensibilities. He objects to the idea of self-directed effort as a means of experiencing art. He sees the intention of a single artist as primary. He speaks of inevitability. He's jealous of his free time, those precious hours he has left for cultivation. He sees art not as an escape from life, but a way to understand and accept life as it is. No doubt about it. Roger Ebert is, like me, a hopeless romantic. Arthur Schopenhauer is the philosopher most closely associated with romanticism. You think Roger Ebert's a curmudgeon? Where do you meet Schopenhauer? When he was appointed lecturer at the University of Berlin in 1820, the faculty included the world-famous philosopher George Hegel. The young Schopenhauer considered Hegel to be, quote, a clumsy charlatan. He scheduled his lectures at exactly the same time as Hegel's to draw his students away. <laughs> well, it didn't work. His classrooms were empty. He eventually left academia in disgust. Schopenhauer once wrote that marriage is like, quote, reaching blindfolded into a sack, hoping to find an eel among the snakes. He was also an atheist. He did not believe in a personal, omnipotent God. Instead, Schopenhauer believed that the essence of the universe is being. A blind, irrational, unquenchable thirst to exist he called will zum Leben, and that everything we perceive is a representation of this will to live. Because we ourselves are products of will, we spend most of our lives trapped in a cycle of striving and boredom. We're constantly willing ourselves to attain our goals, but when we do attain them, we're disappointed and move on to something else again and again until the final disappointment of death. To Schopenhauer, free will and real choice were cruel illusions and desire a prison. Schopenhauer does have a reputation for being pessimistic. But he really wasn't, because he also believed that there's a way to leap off the wheel of desire. That way is the contemplation, the contemplation of sublime art. Sublime art is the door to a perspective on reality that transcends will. It frees us from the agony of contingency and causality and gives us a brief, precious glimpse of what we really are. One thing, already complete and perfectly ambiguous. Bob Dylan echoed Schopenhauer when he said that the purpose of art is to stop time. To Schopenhauer, the creation of sublime art was the noblest of human undertakings. And artists, especially musicians, were the high priests of civilization. Not surprisingly, a lot of 19th century artists really like this guy. <laughs> Brahms, Tolstoy, Mahler, Proust, Einstein, Freud, and Jung were all strongly influenced by Schopenhauer. Richard Wagner was practically a disciple. If we could go back now and ask Schopenhauer whether or not a game, any game, could become a sublime work of art, how would he respond? He'd probably just pat you on the shoulder, shake his head, and chuckle. Why is this? As you all know, games are about choices. Sid Meier famously defined games as a series of interesting choices. And choice is a fundamental expression of will. How can an activity motivated by decision-making, striving, goals, and competition, a deliberate concentration of the force of will be used to transcend will itself? You might as well try to smother a flame with oxygen. Game designers are taught that the ideal player experience is something called 
flow. Flow is that magical state of highly focused motivation, a kind of skating on the fine edge of effort and challenge. Flow leads to a state of euphoric exhilaration. Bow before she sent me high in Poppins, the prophets of flow. Game flow is work made fun. Flow keeps you joyfully working, even in your free time. You heard it here first. Game flow will be the harness of the new labor class. <laughs> flow is painless effort. But pain management is not the business of art. Entrancement is not insight. Flow is an aesthetic. In my digital game design one class, I define play as superfluous activity. I define a toy as something that elicits play, and a game as a toy with rules and a goal. Games are purposeful. They are defined as the exercise of choice and will towards a self-maximizing goal. But sublime art is like a toy. It elicits play in the soul. And the pleasure we get from it lies precisely in the fact that it has no rules, no goal, no purpose. Oscar Wilde was not being flippant when he wrote, all art is quite useless. If the romantics were right, if the purpose of sublime art is to solve the mystery of choice, it's hard to see how goal chasing can be anything but a distraction. We can admire an elegant game design from the outside, like a museum game under glass. But once you enter Weisinger's magic circle and start groping at preferences, the attitude of calm, radical acceptance necessary to cultivate insight is lost. The concert pianist Glenn Gould characterized the romantic conception of sublime art most vividly when he wrote, the justification of art is the internal combustion it ignites in the hearts of men and not its shallow, externalized, public manifestations. The purpose of art is not the release of a momentary ejection of adrenaline, but is rather the gradual, lifelong construction of a state of wonder and serenity. The conference program promised that I would offer you my own definition of art. Here it is, in all its moldy old romantic splendor. Sublime art is the still evocation of the inexpressible. If these definitions of art do not speak to you, ignore them. Time is on your side. But if they do speak to you, beware. You too may someday be dismissed as a tiresome old fool who doesn't get it. Games have been good to me. I love playing them, and I love giving my students a space to learn about them. An hour or two spent playing Defense Grid or Plants vs. Zombies isn't a waste of time. There's nothing wrong with recreation. We need it. I need it. It's good for me. But when I feel the need for reflection, for insight, wisdom, or consolation, I turn my computers off. These needs are the ambit of the sublime arts which are inspired and informed by philosophy and by faith. All sublime art is devotional. 24 game developers conferences ago, I sat in Chris Crawford's living room together with a few dozen other young hopefuls and imagined a future in which video games would be recognized as a great art form as important as the movies they reviewed every week on Siskel and Ebert. 
Look at us. Video games are now bigger than movies. But they didn't need to be great art to get here. They just needed to be great fun. You can argue that this kitschy dog spoils the effect of Northcote's painting, but I've come to kind of like the little guy. He keeps the chess players and the golden boy from taking themselves too seriously. I'm told that the Fairmont is tearing down the old Tonga room pretty soon to make way some, some, for some fancy new high-tech condos. Tell you what, what do you say we all go up there right now? <laughs> One more time, raise a few Mai Tais to Roger Ebert, share a few laughs, and listen to the rain. Thank you. Thank you very much.